It's time for our afternoon keynotes. Please welcome to the stage the president and CEO of Foot Locker Inc., Mary Dillon. Mary will be interviewed by Sheena Butler Young, senior correspondent at the Business of Fashion. Nelly's here tonight, I hear. Oh, he's here tonight. Let's go. I got my all white ready to go. I'm <laughs> looking forward to it. Mary, I'm so excited to be here with you today to talk about unlocking the sneakerhead in us all. Thank you. I feel like in so many ways, your career, your CV, is like a shop talk case study, right? You've touched so many parts of the retail sector restaurant retail, beauty, and now you sit at the helm of probably the most recognizable athletic footwear and apparel retailer. So I have to start with the obvious question. Are you a sneakerhead, Mary? What does that am mean? Am I a sneaker? I am <laughs> what does that mean? In, I am unlocking my own inner sneakerhead, which I believe we're going to be able to do for everyone. So, yeah. well, I, I am wearing Air Force Ones. Love it. Uh, and I've long been in the category as a runner, mm. uh, but now I'm also learning about how you can really create a sneaker wardrobe. So. Yeah. Um, it's, that's what Foot Locker's here to do. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the, the idea of Sneakerhead has like evolved to be less exclusionary and more inclusive. And so we're owning that uh, right now. I want to talk about, you know, you've made sort of a, a transition, right? You, you come from beauty to, uh, to athletic retail. Did it feel like a stark jump to you? Like, what was that transition? Like, I think people might think that beauty feels very feminine and ethereal, and then athletic footwear and apparel feels not. Does it feel like a stark jump for you? Well, actually, um, first of all, I'll say I'm thrilled and honored to be leading Foot Locker. It's, I'm having a great time. And if there's one thing I've learned in the combination of CPG and retail is that, you know, we have to think about people not through the lens of demographics, but mm. psychographics, needs, and motivations. Sure. And so there's a lot of different reasons why people buy sneakers. And actually, there's a lot of similarities in terms of sneaker and beauty sure. in terms of the categories, like super high engagement, often about self-expression, mm -hmm. you know, physical matters, digi digital matters. So in many ways, I mean, it's not it's the same at all, yeah. uh, but there's some similarities. Yeah, are there transferable skills and capabilities that mean the most to you now that you've taken from your career? You also worked at USL. You're like, you really, when I say she's touched every single part she of... She turning up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Are there transferable skills? I think we're in such an interesting moment now when it comes to leadership. Obviously, the pandemic and the future of work and how people look at the role that their jobs play in their lives. It's really challenging retailers to leaders to pull a lot out of themselves. Talk to me about those capabilities that right. mean most. Well, yeah. I mean... I guess the common thread throughout my career is that I've led consumer focused businesses. And so I'd say there's a couple things that are common threads. One is to really put the consumer at the center of everything we do, which sounds kind of like a given. Yeah. But I think especially in retail, historically, it's been a bit siloed. You know, it's about the products that we buy and then it's about put it, some marketing around it and then put it in the stores, sure. right? And really, I think the blend that I've tried to create both at Ulta Beauty, I know there's some Ulta Beauty here people yeah. today, uh, and, and, and we're doing it at Foot Locker as well, is to really try to create more of a consumer-driven demand engine Sure. Products that we sell are super important. Obviously, that's what the business is about. So there's that. The second common thread for me is really truly respecting the voices and the opinions of the people that run our business every day, and those are our store teams. And at Foot Locker, hopefully you guys saw it in the video, our stripers are iconic. I mean, actually, Foot Locker is a really well-known and loved brand, mm -hmm. and the Piper Jaffray study of top footwear brands, we're the only retailer that comes up in the top 10. Uh, that's not so, surprising, probably. And yeah. really, a big part of it is our stripers. And mm -hmm. so we hire young people across the world for a global business who love sneakers, and often it's their first job, is at Foot Locker. And so really taking the insights that we can get from the people that we hire and build careers for and infusing that into our business model. Those are kind of the two common threads that I think are the way that I lead and I think can really work for almost any consumer business. Yeah. Is there a leadership philosophy that drives that? Like if I were to go to people on your team and I said, what's Mary's leadership philosophy? What would they say? Okay, number one, they would say have some fun, I hope, because like, come on, we're having I, I some fun tell. here. I so there's tell, that. Yeah. Um, there's, there's kind of a way that I think about bringing together the best of an enterprise, which is to surround myself. I'm not a top-down leader. Like, I don't have all the answers, but I know how to create a great team of people. And I bring together people that have 
great functional expertise. So like somebody who's reporting to the CEO, they got to be top of their game on whether it's supply chain or stores or marketing. Combined with the ability to get out of the functional silo and think through the lens of the enterprise. So I call that enterprise thinking and being willing to kind of sit around a table and make decisions that really are benefiting the entire enterprise, maybe not just your function. Yeah. And then the third, which is closely related, is collaboration. Now, again, this isn't about like everybody has to agree on everything, nothing like that. Yeah. It's about understanding the power of getting input from your cross-functional peers to get to the best solutions. Yeah. And I find that when, you know, I bring people together with those skills and values, I guess, around leadership, and they also have people around them that do the same, it really creates a more agile, um, quick solution kind of business, and it's fun. Amazing. You know, you joined Foot Locker at quite an interesting time, right? In the last five years or so, I would say, we saw the emergence of these DTC brands, and I, I can name a few, but I won't, uh, that, you know, they really were obsessed with that channel, and they found a lot of success. And then we saw these heritage brands, these really hot brands that we all know and love, also sort of lean in to that channel. Well, that's had an interesting shakeout. I think everyone in the room would agree. What do you make of what's happened with this sort of DTC obsession, this move away from retail partnerships that brands did, and then now it seems like, you may or may not agree, it seems like it's coming back around. What do you make of what's happened? Yeah, well, actually, you know, I saw a very similar dynamic in beauty, sure. which is that really both ways to approach the marketplace matter and work, mm -hmm. okay? And Foot Locker plays a very specific role in the sneaker ecosystem. And we're really focused on, I, I really mean this, I think unlocking the inner sneaker head in everybody, there's so many ways to get involved in the category. And once you start wearing sneakers, you do not go back. I'm just gonna test I agree, that, okay? my, my knees right. and ankles appreciate the sneakers <laughs> yes. a thousand percent. But, but what I was gonna say is that, you know, of course, Great brands want to have and, and should have a direct relationship with customers as well as in the certain categories like sneakers, like beauty. Really, it's driven by choice and it's driven by selection. It's driven by sometimes a physical in-store experience as well as an online experience. So I don't think it's one or the other. My job is to make sure that Foot Locker has a unique and distinct role in the ecosystem, and we do. Yeah. We have a 50-year history in sneaker culture, and we're really going to relaunch the brand and really, I think, bring even more energy to that, but I think they both can coexist and that's what's happening. Sure, yeah, what I was alluding to was sort of that it seems like those brands thought they were really gonna be able to do it on their own. It seems like they, they came back, they I came back think, around. I don't think anybody was saying they could do it on their own. I mean, yeah. I, think, I think broadly as an industry, there's a recognition that both, you know, working through a multi-brand retailer and we have stores, you know, 2,700 stores around the world That's and we, have a, 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 we really have a broad demographic base, but we definitely skew younger uh, in terms of our consumer base and we're reaching some folks that maybe wouldn't be reached through DTC only. So. Absolutely. To that point, how have your supplier conversations evolved? What did they sound like in the past and what do they sound like now? How do you nurture and build relationships with brands in this moment and what's the biggest change you've had to undertake? I think it's probably one of the most important things that, that a, a retail CEO, especially a multi-brand retailer, needs to do. And again, I would say that, you know, um, it's about working together to really build our businesses mutually and profitably over time. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine, I'm still really getting to know people. It's only been about six months, oh, but sure. I've met with you know, almost all of our top brands and building together on our plans as we move forward and also sharing with them our vision for growth. You know, we're gonna, we have something we call the lace-up plan, which is really about simplifying our business, investing in it, and growing it. And that's gonna be through really like expanding sneaker culture, transforming our real estate portfolio, and then I'd say really investing in all things digital. So loyalty, omnichannel. So sharing that with our brand partners, and that's a phrase I, I use. I don't say vendors, I don't say, you know, it's really, they are our partners and we're partners with theirs. Yeah, certainly word choice alone can signal so many important things, yeah. partners versus a vendor. Yeah. Just sounds more warm and human. You know, you said something uh, on the, the earnings call this month around a specific, speaking of hot brands and Air Forces, on a specific partnership, which is a really important one which is with Nike, yeah. you described it as being sort of renewed and revitalized. What does that look like to the consumer? If I'm walking into a, a Foot Locker store a year from now, how do I see that revised and, uh, or revitalized and renewed partnership show up? Yes, yeah. so, well, first of all, as you walk into Foot Locker stores over time, what you'll see is we're evolving the portfolio and really creating a store of the future. So more experiential, more off-mall, so uh, it, some bigger formats that allow for us to really have a big 
selection of products. Um, you know, we've been working very closely with Nike from day one. They've welcomed me to the industry, which is great. And there are certain areas that we really work best together as partners. Basketball, all things basketball. Yeah. Um, kids, because Kids Foot Locker is really the only made retailer of premium focused sneakers for kids and all things sneaker culture. And so you'll continue to see us bring newness and innovation and celebrate our brands together. Uh, we have the 50th anniversary of, of Foot Locker coming up next year, so you'll see some things there, okay. uh, as well as other launches. Sounds great. So you're, you've also talked about making this shift from being product-led to consumer-led. It's interesting because I was, I was reflecting on that and I thought, you know, for a long time in retail, the mantra is product is king. Yeah. And now it feels like the consumer is like, no, by the way, I'll tell you what's king, right? But that feels like that might be a tough transition. Speaking of 50 years, retailers that are, have had a history of doing something one way, it's tough to make that switch. How do you plan to, to make that change? Yes, from well, product products do matter because that is what we sell. Yeah. And, and so, but what I'd say is that th stepping back and thinking about, so we recently did a, a big consumer segmentation, category segmentation study, and getting to the higher order reasons that people might come to the category, understanding that there's a sneaker maven yeah. Uh, which is somebody who really is obsessed with the newest and latest and greatest. There's folks that we call the fashion forward expressionists, mm -hmm. which is really more about kind of sneakers and to make yourself look even better than kind you might have cool, before. Yeah. It's about active athletes, which is uh, that category speaks for itself it, and so on. So what we're doing is orienting our thinking around how do we think about the consumer segments, the brands that fit best, our banners. We have five different banners that we operate. So how do we position those and then create demand tools through whether it's loyalty or CRM, all the things everybody here knows about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to really target folks with meaningful big ideas versus just here's a product and a price. And so it's an evolution, but it honestly, I think, is really a great way to not only drive great brand growth because you're not reliant only on discounts when you're trying to move something, right? It's really bigger. Um, and category growth. I mean, I actually think that we could really drive category growth by introducing more people to the category of sneakers. Sure. So and we'll see. <laughs> absolutely. And e-com seems like an important channel to do some of what yeah. you just described. You know, Foot Locker's e-commerce penetration is around 16%, and you've said publicly that you think that's too low. Yeah. Why, why is Foot Locker underpenetrated online? Well, thank you for doing all your homework. I like that. I tried, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we definitely, this is the thing I'm excited about. There's so much low hanging fruit, there's so many opportunities. Oh. And part of it is, I mean, frankly, we have to invest in core technology to allow ourselves to have a better, seam, seamless consumer experience, okay? And so we've you know, communicated that 23. This year is a reset year. We're going to mm -hmm. start to invest and then really inc increase the ability for people to shop easier with us to get the products faster. I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but these are pretty basic, yeah. but it's just great opportunity. And the same would hold true of our loyalty program, which is called FLX. It was originally designed to be about access to launches, which is important. Sure. But most loyalty programs today are really also about encouraging loyalty. You know, more, Absolutely. the more you spend, the more you get. So we're going to relaunch and pilot that. So those are just a couple of the ways that I think we can, again, get to this more consumer driven um, capability as well. Absolutely. Speaking of homework, I have another another data point for yes. you. The other thing that um, obviously it's it's been it was announced this month. Foot Locker will will close about 400 stores. There is a plan alongside that to open some different kind of concept stores. Talk to me about how you're looking at brick and mortar now, and what's a store for? Yeah. Well, yeah, we're reshaping the portfolio mm. to focus on the the types of store formats and the geographies and the banners that are we're best set up to succeed with. So while we are closing doors, we're also opening up new stores that are bigger. Mm -hmm. So overall, our square footage actually is going to be slightly up over the next three, four years. But the role of store is critical. And one of the things I'm most proud about is that Foot Locker has stores, about 8% of our fleet are what we call community stores. Mm -hmm. And they're in the hearts of communities where sneakers are a big part of the culture, uh, where we really connect with the community in terms of who we hire even local designers, local artwork, activation for families. Those are some of our very best stores. And they're large stores, they're like 15,000 square feet. So you'll, we have those around the US as well as in Europe. We're gonna grow more of those. We're gonna ship more off mall because mm -hmm. that obviously is going to be important for us as well. Although we've got plenty of malls that are performing really well, mall stores, but we're going to increase our off-mall penetration at 50%. And, you know, I think really the whole role of the store is, is exactly what retail is about, right? There's categories like sneakers where some people want to come in, get the great customer experience from our stripers. We have yeah. over 90% NPS in stores. Yeah. Just saying. Um, and... 
trying things on. Um, all sorts of reasons why you might shop in person and online. So as we grow that digital penetration that you mentioned from 17 to 25 percent, that will be accretive to what's happening in the stores. So those become the best guess. Sure. Specifically to malls, is there why the shift away from malls in, in particular? Is there a particular challenge that you're looking at, at the, in the mall? Uh, I mean, chance? that's been a macro trend for a while, right? And so um, we do have plenty of stores in malls that, I mean, where the mall is the place to shop, and we are a traffic driver, and they perform really well. But are the malls, the C&D malls, the ones that are performing less, obviously the trend has been to move out and to move off mall to be in more convenient at shopping centers and things yeah. like that. So, And that's great. I, there's another thing I was thinking about as we were talking about the, the mall stores and like this messaging and, or leadership in this moment. And I think you'll, you'll have a good, a good thought on this around culture. So obviously we've had in the last couple years uh, a labor shortage. Like there's this stubbornly um, consistent figure of two jobs to every available worker and this shift that a lot of companies have talked about that people are not disposable, human capital is your biggest thing. How do you message around a, a headline around store closures and making sure that people feel insulated and excited about working for, for Foot Locker and not being afraid in an economic downturn? Yeah, no, that's it's a great question. Listen, I mean, one of the first decisions I made is to invest even more in our store teams, which we've built into our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, they are truly what differentiates um, us from every other retailer in the segment. And we have got lots of longevity. We have met, I have met store managers around the world for Foot Locker that have been as a manager for 10, 20 years. And they're really nurturing a, a next generation of young people in, in these jobs and in the roles. So, so for us, store closures aside, there, we always give people opportunities to work in other stores. We've got bigger stores opening, so they need more folks. But it is truly something that I, we care a lot about, and we're going to continue to invest in our, our teams in the stores. I heard you were at the Fashion Mall Foot Locker store yesterday. Yes. Yeah, how was it? Were they excited to see you? Did you say who you were? Oh, yeah. I don't do like a, I don't do like a, I mean, I, listen, when I go visit stores, this is not about, I'm not inspecting. I'm not looking to make sure I'm there to build culture and to listen and to learn. And every single time I get good ideas and things that we can go and implement right away. And I find that our leaders are very willing to tell me what's working, what's not working, if you just ask. That's awesome. How are you going to diversify product assortment moving forward? I know that's a huge part of your plan is to kind of not, it's a smart plan, not to lean on a hero product or a hero brand. Are there any, any areas that you would lean in more? Well, listen, uh, expanding sneaker cultures is, real, is really going to be about more sneakers, more occasions, more customers. Absolutely. And so with all of our brand partners, and we have a lot, right? We have Nike, Adidas, New Balance, Puma, On, Hoka, Crocs, Ugg. I mean, the, a really the great gamut yeah, yeah, of brands. Yeah. And so really it's about working with them to, like, obviously they're driving innovation all the time, making sure that we position ourselves really well to help show how we can bring their brands to life in store, out of store, constantly you know, looking at more exclusives, which we're going to have more exclusives over time, more new brands. I mean, there aren't a lot of new brands that come to market in footwear, but we'll be there when they do. Yeah. As you think about sort of the next six months to a year, and for Foot Locker specifically, but also for the athletic footwear and apparel sector as a whole, where do you see the biggest opportunities? What makes you most excited? And of course, what keeps you up at night? Yeah. Not much keeps you up at night. That's I, good. I, yeah. I need that <laughs> regimen. <laughs> exactly. Um, I would say that for Foot Locker Inc., it is about really building the capabilities that I've described and, and really opening up, I guess, almost relaunching the brand and reintroducing Foot Locker and the sneaker category. To I think there's plenty of opportunity to drive growth because the percent of sneakers in people's closets today is is like 40%. It can be way, way more than that over time. And that we're on a mission to do that. And I think, you know, like every business, we're keeping a close eye on the economy, on inflation, on just spending and whatnot. And, you know, we think this is a category, again, a little bit like beauty, that if you're into the category, you're choosing it. It's an affordable indulgence, right? But we don't take that for granted. So we'll constantly be looking at the value equation as well. Are there any things that you think for you as a leader for Foot Locker as an organization that will make the biggest difference between success and failure? If you had to put your bets on something that's going to make that big difference for you, what, what, what would, that, would that be? That is a really good question. I, I don't know if I have just one answer, but yeah. I would say, you know, as, a, as an organization, moving with speed and being clear what we're trying to solve for. And like I said, for me, largely it's probably the biggest difference will be modernizing how we go to market, right? So improving the customer experience and all things digital will be the fastest unlock to go, you know, to more personalization, um, ease of experience, those things, and then with this loyalty relaunch, I think will be the biggest unlocks. 
Uh, it's just a matter of how quickly can we get, get it done. <laughs> Absolutely. And I have to ask you the, the, the last question. Are you coming to the Nelly party tonight and are you going to wear the Air Force Ones? Had I known Nelly was going to be here, I would love to. No, I actually have, I can't, I can't stay for that, but I okay. want to get a full download, okay? Well, Mary, thank you so much. It was a thank pleasure. You. I've learned so much and I'm sure everyone else thank did. You. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes.